identifiers. You have 20 minutes. And then you have a few more minutes for questions, but you only have 20 minutes. If I tell you 30, it will be too long. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fernando Gont. I come from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And this presentation is about the plague, the plague of uh, predictable transient numeric identifiers. I am the presenter. I am here on stage, but the materials and the content and the documents I will speak about are the result of the work I've done with Ivan Arce from Argentina as well. Those of you working in security are probably familiar with him. I was a teenager still in high school when he already had a very well-established career. It's been my honor to work with him in this work. So the plague of predictable transient number numeric identifiers, that is the title of our presentation. So the first question that you might have is what the hell is that? So we, this is a very strange name. And well, sometimes formal documents need a title like that. So this is the formal definition that we came up with that we presented in the RFC. We're speaking about data objects that can be used to identify different parts or elements in a protocol. And we can distinguish that section or object of the protocol from other elements of that protocol. It is easier if we look at different examples. It is easier to understand if we look at the examples. So what can we, different examples of transient numeric identifiers. For example, TCP fragment IDs that we can have in IPv4 or 6. Other examples are the DNS ID, or sometimes we call it transaction ID. It is a value that we use to match questions and answers in the DNS, or to help match questions with answers in the DNS. Other examples are the interface identifiers for IPv6, and so on. Now, what is not a transient numeric identifier? Well, protocol values specified by IANA, that are, those are facts, they are not transient. Every other value that changes over time, that is uh, what we are referring to. So what is the problem with transient numeric identifiers? Well, if we look at what has happened over the past 40 years, many of the things that we have done, it's been done wrong. So what do you mean that it's wrong? Well, I mean that when you select these values incorrectly, from a security standpoint, I mean, it could be predictable, it could be unnecessary if they have patterns that they shouldn't have, and that leads to security or privacy problems. Now, if you look at the past 40 years, I mean, you might say, well, it is impossible that we've done it wrong over the past 40 years. So I put together this timeline. It's not comprehensive, but it provides an overview of the work that's been done over the course of 40 years on transient numeric IDs, on different protocols for different people, for different implementations. So you can see how we have banged our heads on the same thing over and over. So for the first set of examples, at least the ones that I've been able to find on 85, you have a Morris paper on the problems of using predictable ISNs. What this person said is that all of the TCP implementations will use predictable ISNs, and thanks to that, you could spoof connections or create connections between two systems, even though you might not even be on the way of the two connections. So this, again, is not comprehensive, but another event in 95, that same problem that had been discussed 10 years before was actually used in reality, and you might know it as the Kevin Mednick attack 
that vulnerability was exploited, a vulnerability that had been discussed 10 years before. In 1996, the OpenBSD people, who have been pioneers in at least patching many of these things, they started implementing the randomization, port randomization implementation for transient ports. What else? What else? 1996 work by Salvatore San Filippo. He spoke about or he explained about the problem of using predictable fragment IDs. What else? 2001, Thomas Norton, another author, spoke about the problems on interface, IPVC interface identifiers and the privacy problems. 2001, 15 years after that, there were problems with TCP sequence numbers and so on and so forth. For example, one of the most iconic cases, 2008, the very famous Kamensky attack or whatever other name you might know it for, attack against the DNS that well, in addition to maybe more formal or more accurate solutions at the time, at least that attack was dependent or exploited ident uh, predictable numeric identifiers like the port number, DNS ID, and so on. There's um, other examples, for example, identifiers for different protocols until 2023 when we had the first the first rec general recommendation was issued on specifications on the IETF environment. This tries to show what the problem is and to <coughs> summarize the fact that over the course of 40 years, we would find the same problem for different protocols, but the underlying condition was basically the same. <coughs> Ivan Arce and I got together and we I mean we had worked on this area but solving problems for specific protocols. On screen you have part of the work that I did, particular specifications and patches to solve that problem, but it was all a reaction to something, an implementation or a specification, and we would have a problem and then come uh, running behind with the solution. So we asked ourselves two things. Why is it that for so long this affected so many different identifiers, different protocols, specifications and implementations? And the second question was, is there anything that we can do proactively to avoid or to prevent from just using a patch once the problem was already there instead of preventing the problem from happening in implementation specifications and so on? So that was uh, what we wanted to do. So to better understand the problem, we needed a root cause analysis. Why is it that the same problem affected so many specifications or implementations? Basically, what the conclusion that we drew was that the main problem could be found in three aspects. The first one, if you looked at the different protocol specifications, the properties of these identifiers, so what they needed to comply with was not clearly stipulated. Um, I could go into further detail later on. The second one is that many specifications recommended incorrect algorithms. So if someone had, for example, full compliance with the specification, would uh, doing things incorrectly by following the advice on the specification. Or in other cases, the specification recommended no algorithm and that was left up to the developer working on that protocol. And in other cases, well, some implementations would do whatever they wanted with or without any sort of guide or using the corresponding standards. So to go into more detail into the technical aspects of those identifiers, these are numeric identifiers. So we're speaking about a number that identifies a section of the protocol. So 
this could be just any number you might be wondering no according to the protocol on the object that we are they identifying those numbers need to have some certain property for example having a unique value you select the value so the value needs to be unique another potential requirement for interoperability is that it is an increasing sequence. This is a more complex way to say that it's a value that increases, not a linear function, but rather increases in number. The curve might change, but increases in number. Another requirement for interoperability, we have a unique value and that is stable in a given context. For example, when you're going to configure an IP address through Slack, there is a router that is announcing a prefix for that network and you need to I to select the interface identifier. We might say that we want that interface identifier to be stable within that network. So every time I connect a system to the network, it will always set up the same address. That's how Slack works. So um, we have uh, two security requirements at first, and then it comes the obvious question, what, what happens if I don't uh, comply with that? Basically, we defined two types of uh, severity of uh, failures, soft and hard failures. And the idea is simple. When we speak of soft failure, that means that if for any reason you don't comply with the requirement, things are not so bad. That is, that uh, solving the problem is cheap. For instance, it does not affect uh, the protocol performance. The problem can be repaired in a, a short time, and it's not something that will, you know, that for instance, for generating uh, the ID incorrectly, then the protocol wouldn't work for 30 minutes. And then what did you find in the specifications, I would say, in all of them, is that uh, when you have the specification of the identifiers, this is not specified. So you have an ID, and maybe you can assume or guess uh, its properties, but it is not formally specified. So everything is up to the person that implements it, who cannot be blame, blamed either. And if you don't haven't uh, don't have these things defined. There, you don't have a criterion to see what algorithm you're going to use. Is it the best algorithm you could use? Well, you don't know it because you don't know what problem you have to solve. The second issue, I mentioned problems in the specifications themselves. If you go to almost all the specific classical specifications, many of them had uh, reviews later on, all of them except for 791, but in all of them, they recommend incorrect algorithms or that uh, pose uh, privacy or security problems. In the case of IPv4, for instance, they recommend to use a global counter to, for the fragment ID. The uh, uh, RFC 2460, the previous uh, uh, specification of IPv6 recommended a global counter for the fragment ID. 793 for the TCP specification recommended a global timer-based uh, generator for ISNs. So the specification itself told you to select the numbers in the wrong way. So afterwards, you have specifications where they fail to recommend, uh, they don't recommend a bad algorithm, but they don't recommend anything. So the uh, the person that's going to implement it will not uh, uh, pull their hair saying, well, let's uh, think of what algorithms we'll use. They'll, they use something with which the protocol works, and in many cases, it uh, works and it can interoperate, but the price paid is that it poses security or privacy issues. And the last issue that I mentioned were well, there are implementations that do whatever they want. So you can put something in the standard, but then people would do whatever they want. In some cases, it's because, but in other cases, in the original specifications, they had problems, and it wasn't until there was a later review or later specifications where they fixed it. So it's not that necessarily they ignored the recommendation, but uh, uh, they hadn't uh, caught up with uh, the most recent updates. So obviously, this was, well, we had to understand the problem. So the next thing was what to do to solve it, what we thought of was basically to categorize all the identifiers, the 
uh, temporal numeric identifiers that we knew to see whether we could generate a group of uh, categories that would include them all in an exercise. So, and again, if we found a new identifier that uh, for which our taxonomy didn't apply, something needed to be changed. For the time being, it worked. And the basic idea was if basically we could categorize all the types of identifiers of uh, most uh, protocols in a re reduced number of categories. The idea was for each category to generate a good algorithm, or at least good for us, and to recommend to recommend those algorithms for those identifiers. Taxonomy can be summarized as follows. We define four different categories, and here again, it's a combination of interoperability requirements and the severity of uh, the failure entailed. For instance, category one, the identifiers need to be unique and uh, it's a soft failure. That means that if for any reason I choose a value that is what's already being used, uh, the problem is not too big. Category two, they have to be unique, but there is a hard failure. You can't fail in choosing the ID because if not, one way or the other, the protocol will uh, break. And third, uh, the values have to be unique but stable within context. And uh, and in a category four, the values are m monotonically increasing within a certain context. To your, in the right column, you have the IDs that we believe that fall in each of those categories. For instance, for the first case, you have the flow label and DNS ID that need to be unique, but if they are repeated, it's, it's not such a problem. The same, same applies to the rest. The next thing was saying, well, we have four categories. Let's try and propose a um, good or quite good algorithm for each. And they're really very simple algorithms. The first, in, in all the cases, the flow ch uh, uh, chart um, uh, is the way you'll find it in the implementation and to the right, what is re done in real life. So in the first case, when you have a unique number, but if you, if, uh, you repeat the value, there's no problem. Basically, what you do is you select a value at random, and if you happen to find, according to the protocol, sometimes that can be checked locally. If that value is already being used, then what you do is to select the next value available. This is extremely popular. The first implementations, for instance, in port randomizations, so that's what you use. And today, I think that in freed is day, and this is what they use. The second category, we said that the values need to be unique, but there it's a hard failure. I can't just uh, um, see what happens because it can be random, but it can be the same as I just pointed out. So I'm going to kick the ball for uh, later on, and I'm going to use the same algorithms that we use for monotonically increasing uh, our values. So what's the idea? If I use values, the subsequent values, if I do apply a, a linear function and the offset is a random and not a slope, basically the frequency of reusing these values will be reduced. Well, it depends on a lot of things, but that's generally the case. So these algorithms, we're going to see two, uh, two algorithms uh, ahead. The next category three was a uh, unique value stable within a certain context. This is the way Slack is uh, operates today. If you connect a workstation of the last uh, 10 years, this is the algorithm they use. And uh, so in a nutshell, w this is more or less what they do. They compute a hash function, a secure uh, hash function on a counter uh, context and a secret key. And the counter, if, if I uh, found a collision, if the value is already being used, how do I solve this? Do I increase the counter? Then I can select a different value. And the context is the context in which the value is constant. For the case of Slack, that would be the easiest example. If I want to configure interface uh, into 
uh, indicators, the identifiers then that would be the prefix of configuration of Slack, the slash 64 that's announcing the local, uh, is being announced by the local router. So this, these are unique uh, values and stable in a certain context, and the context depends on the use. In the case of Slack, this is where this can be used, uh, be the auto configuration prefix. And the last category that I mentioned earlier are values that are monotonically increasing. I said that this is an offset that is random with a linear function, and the expression is this, in essence, a computer hash on a, in a context, the idea of context as, as we described earlier, and a secret key that will give me a value that, for obvious reasons, one with the, the same context, the result of the hash is going to be the same, and then I have a counter that gives me the lines. Here I put counter just to uh, simplify it, but it doesn't literally have have to be a counter, one, 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 like that. As a matter of fact, what we would normally do, going from a minimum value to, and to increase it by a random value, the more I, we can uh, uh, go uh, far from the predictable, the better. So uh, it, with a constant increases, that's not what we want. But this was just to, for the sake of simplicity. This is, if you wish, uh, the technical result of the issue. So if you asked uh, how come people worked with this for 40 years, it took 40 years to do this, well, well, it wasn't done. Uh, they solved the problems in specific cases, and they never, nobody ever made an attempt to solve this for once and for all. But that's, uh, that's the big science here. Now, what did we do? Because uh, you may have a technical solution on your desk, but in order for that technical solution to uh, drive a change in real life, you have to take it and propose it to, uh, to the right place. And in this case, the right place is IETF and IRTF. So what did we do? First, we published a document. That's the first one that you have there in the list. In essence, it includes everything that I described in this presentation, basically. Proceed procedural IETF things uh, because of uh, a procedure thing. So they divided th this in three uh, parts. The first, the one the timeline ended up being um, I RFC 9414 was published in 2023, RFC 9415 that has the taxonomy and associated algorithms. But so far, this was just research. Nothing would force uh, these specification authors to do anything uh, different. And there, uh, RFC 9416 was the, uh, the most difficult one, not because of the complexity. We don't know why. What does RFC 9416 do? It's uh, the only one that I didn't mention. Well, the first thing is important. It updates RFC 3552. Uh, so what the hell is that RFC? Well, it's the document that gives the recommendations of how to write uh, the security considerations in Internet Protocol. How do you analyze security? It was published about 20 years ago. It had received only one update. We did the second update, and I don't know whether that uh, means that we did the right thing or the others did the wrong thing, but uh, I think that that was a significant step forward. And uh, what are the requirements that it introduces? Well, first of all, if you have a specification of a protocol that e uses uh, um, the temporal uh, uh, numeric uh, identifiers, you must specify their interoperability requirements, the properties that that identifier needs uh, to follow, and uh, what is the severity of the failure if that is not met. You need to analyze the vulnerability uh, to see what happens. If, if it's predictable, what could the attacker win? And the third, quite obvious, uh, unless you have a good uh, reason, you shouldn't use predictable uh, values. The fourth is that all specifications need to recommend one algorithm for generating the IDs, and then the developer can do something better if they wish to. But by default, they must uh, you must have instructions, do this, because we know it's good enough. And the last issue is even the protocols that use cryptographic techniques for certain things need to consider these recommendations. So many of these issues uh, have a, a historical political background, but in a nutshell, when, when uh, we were working at this, uh, 
uh, IETF was working with, uh, they didn't uh, develop it, but they adopted it, so it was the protocol that you couldn't touch. But uh, it did the wrong thing with the identifiers, so they said, well, we don't want, don't want to change anything. So originally they said, well, but if we are using cryptographic techniques, uh, this uh, we shouldn't be used well, so part of the struggle was that. So in the last uh, ballot, uh, b bullet that you have there, um, uh, well, it uh, was not so hard to get. Um, so what are the conclusions? Well, basically, the predictable transit numeric IDs have uh, plagued uh, both the specifications and the implementations for almost uh, 40 years, over 40 years, literally. This was uh, the work we did. That was our effort to tackle the root causes uh, and uh, so that we wouldn't have to continue to patch protocols for another 40 years. And the idea is that basically the work not, was not to publish a document, but to introduce requirements so that uh, future specifications would just have to do things right in this regard. Any questions? We have time for a couple of questions for Fernando. I'm going to kill you with this. Does anybody have any questions? Pablo is there. Pablo of Uruguay. Uh, just administrative issues. Do you th do you expect that in the future this will be followed in specifications like WIG or others? Is there any way you can measure that? How does that work in IETF? Do you have a specific uh, discussions or once it's adopted, you need to follow it? How does that work? That's the first question. And then what happens looking back? So the future is clear. You have a recommendation, but what would you expect? Update uh, in the protocols that uh, worked, uh, that had problems working? Are we going to continue to patch things uh, endlessly? Well, my question is would be my, my answer would be as you work in standardization when you work in standardization that involves people and with, when you put people in any equation just anything can happen basically what tools does this provide you in my view it's the following imagine that someone would standardize a new protocol and for a or b they do things wrong nobody uh, the, that should correct this uh, does it so you as an individual participant you could uh, show the standard and say well here you have a standard that you are not meeting this is uh, a, a law like a law so we are not the best example for that but when we have a law if the uh, are our laws always complied with no but if somebody wants to do things right they have an instrument that they can use it is really up to people. Maybe in the future IETF, I mean, they have a security area. The director, I can't remember the name, a review committee, a security review committee. If I were a member of that committee and you bring me a specification to review and the IDs are wrong, I'll just throw it over your head and I'll just say this is wrong. You need to do this or that. I could do nothing and just keep my mouth shut. This is a tool. Now, if I if it will solve or not things, well, depends how it is used. What you're saying is also good. So into the future, let's suppose that this is done well into the future. What happens if we look back? Well, same thing. If you find, and it has happened to me, if you find protocols that is using identifying wrong, if you do not have a standard of like this, it's like you against the world it will require a bigger effort. If you have a standard like 9416 and someone wants to say that this protocol is okay, but we're not going to use it, well, it is uphill, it is harder. I mean, is there any guarantee that things are going to be done well? No, but at least we have the standard. So are you going to suggest changes or anything in particular uh, in one of my slides I mean before getting into this line of work I published like eight 
RFCs. I fix the transportation boards, the TCPIP boards, the NTP board, the IPv6 interface identifiers. I changed all the standards for those protocols. But each of those changes required working with different groups that might not be familiar with the history and the background information, and it required a bigger effort. So it would be easier with this to fix those protocols that have problems of this nature. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Pablo, for your question, and thank you, Fernando, for your presentation.